We're here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. If you'll take your Bibles and join me in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. That's all the laughing you're going to have today because this is a serious matter uh, that we're going to be looking at from chapter 4 today. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. The ushers will have Bibles in hand as they come up and down the aisles, and they'll be glad to give you a Bible if you wave in their direction. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 is where we're going to be. That's page 473 in those church Bibles, page 473. Now here we are in chapter 4, and this is the fourth week in the book of Ecclesiastes. I, I will be honest with you, I hadn't planned on taking only one chapter a week, but that's what it's turned out to be so far. Every time I have planned to take a section uh, or a couple of chapters of Ecclesiastes at a time, uh, I, I read a section and then the Lord puts me on pause. And so uh, I'm just taking it at the pace I feel he wants us to go. But I know for some of you, you feel like, wow, this is painful. This, this, is, pain this is like watching curling at the Winter Olympics. <laughs> a sport I do not understand. I, I suppose if you're good with a broom, you're Olympic bound. But, uh, but some of you are like, you know, this is, this is uh, can we please breeze through Ecclesiastes and get to the fun stuff in Song of Solomon? But... <sighs> But listen, didn't your mama teach you to eat your vegetables before you have dessert? Okay, and, and Ecclesiastes in some ways, I mean, it's, it's hard to swallow some of this. It's, it's a little difficult. It can be kind of sad. But it's only sad if you recognize that Solomon is writing from a perspective of a guy that has reduced God to the fringes of his life at best. And so... If you're going to be sad reading Ecclesiastes, be sad for the people like Solomon who are trying to navigate life without God. Because otherwise, this is a great book. This is a rich book that reminds us of the true remedy for all that ails us in this world. But without God in the equation, then you can look at the world, you can get weighed down, you can read what Solomon writes, and you can get weighed down. Because that's a perspective from which Solomon is writing. He's writing from the vantage point of a guy who's looking at life through the lens of a life without God. So here's a guy who has all the possessions that money can buy. He has uh, all, all the women that men can lust after. He has all the wine that vineyards could produce, and he has all the success that life has to offer, but he's still unsatisfied, and, and he's still unfulfilled, and he's unhappy, and, and he's overwhelmed. He gets depressed when he looks at, at the world around him w without God in the equation, and, and he is weighed down by all this because he's more obsessed with the horizontal. Uh, 58 times in this book, he talks about life under the sun. So he's always fixated on the horizontal, and he has very little room for the vertical. And that's why 38 times in the book, he talks about how life is meaningless. The Hebrew word is hevel. It's like uh, hevel means smoke or mist or vapor. And that is true about life. It is fleeting like, like mist or vapor or smoke, and it's also hard to grasp in that same way. And so Solomon is, is writing here from that standpoint uh, 3,000 years ago as the king of Israel who has done everything and experimented with everything but still finds his life very empty because he has not made room for God in the equation. Well, when we come here to chapter 4, there's something else that Solomon finds upsetting which has jaded him about life and it is something that has affected many people even today. And I think that you will note with me just really how pretty timely this passage is. I'm only going to read the first three verses, but take a look with me here at chapter 4. This is what it says, verse 1. Again, I looked, Solomon writes, and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who were still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Let's pause there and pray. 
Lord, as we look into chapter four here of Ecclesiastes, we pray that the words of Solomon would challenge our hearts and that we would come to draw near to you because we can see what he says is true about our world. And yet, Lord, our hope is in you. Our eyes are focused on you. And so, Lord, as we draw near to you, we thank you that you promise to draw near to us in a crazy, mixed up, messed up world, Lord. We draw our strength, our comfort, and our hope from you. Despite Solomon's sense of meaninglessness in life, Lord, we thank you that we can turn to you. And so we pray that you'll help us now and remind us of these things as we study your word together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. So Solomon writes here in chapter four about how troubled he is by all the oppression and evil in the world. That's what these first three verses are all about. He's weighed down when he takes a look and he kind of surveys the landscape of humanity and he's troubled by all the oppression and evil in the world. In fact, in verse one, he uses some form of the word oppression three times. In verse one, he, he uses the word oppression and then he writes about how he has seen uh, all, all the tears of the oppressed. Also in verse one, he, he talks about how he has seen all the power of the oppressors. So right there in verse one, oppression, oppressed, oppressors. And twice he says in verse one about those who have been oppressed and they have no comforter and they have no comforter. And then he adds for good measure in verse three, how he has observed all the evil that's another word, evil that is done under the sun. Now, we're not sure exactly what Solomon has been exposed to or what specifically that uh, he has witnessed in terms of oppression or evil or injustice in the world, but I think it is safe to say that not much has changed in 3,000 years from the time that Solomon penned these words, because wherever you have people, you will have oppression, evil, and injustice in the world. You have to look no further than the recent events in Broward County, Florida, to come to that conclusion, that this world is full of evil, injustice, and oppression. Here we have another school shooting that has left many dead, many injured, and many with lifelong memories that they will not be able to shake. And this is yet another tragedy. It has reignited the gun debate. It has once again turned a spotlight onto mental illness. And it has raised the issue of school safety. People are hurt. People are angry. People are sad. People are afraid. And a whole host of other emotions as a result of this singular event. Now, be honest with me, when you first heard the news of what happened in Broward County, was there something in you that said, where was this again versus what was this? Because we've become all too familiar with the what, unfortunately. So now what we're typically asking is where, where did the latest thing happen? Where did the latest thing happen? Now, I'm not trying or even want to wade into the gun debate. The fact of the matter is that it's much bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. Incidences like what happened in Broward County, and now unfortunately they are numerous, are much bigger than just guns. There's a common denominator to all of these unfortunate, horrible incidences. Whether, whether someone brings a gun into a school or a university campus, or whether someone detonates a bomb in a federal building, or whether somebody drives their car or truck up onto a crowded sidewalk, or whether somebody takes box cutters to gain entry into an airplane cockpit, the common denominator to all of that is that there is undeniable evil in the world. It's not a debate about one particular weapon. The common denominator to all of this is that there is undeniable evil 
in this world. And this evil has caused a lot of people to question the meaning and purpose of life and to question God in the equation. And Solomon is no exception, because this is what he's focused on here. He's at a place in his life where he looks at all the oppression and all the evil. Those are the words he uses in the first three verses. And it causes him to question the meaning of life, and it causes him to question things about God. Now, for some people, the matter of evil in the world has so impacted them that it has caused them to question God in, in two ways. Number one, it has caused some people to question the very existence of God. The, the problem of evil in our world has caused some people to question the very existence of God. This may be the very thing that some of you wrestle with, some of your friends wrestle with. There might be people later, later who will watch this by video or listen to it by podcast, and, and you'll say, yeah, yeah, that's kind of my story. I, I wrestle with the existence of God because I see all this evil, I see all this oppression, I see all this injustice in the world, and it seems that all those things are incompatible with a loving God. And so many people who have postulated this, this question in their minds and in their hearts wrestle with all this, because after all, how do you reconcile evil in the world with an all-loving God? And some would say if evil is allowed to exist, then maybe God doesn't. Oppression, injustice, and evil seem more consistent with a non-existent God than with an all-loving God, some would say. And some would say that pain and suffering in the world and in their lives personally is evidence for the absence of God because a true God would not allow such evil to exist, therefore God must not exist. And that's how some of the reasoning goes. Now, I'm, I'm going to give a logical answer to that, but before I do, I want to say in advance that I understand giving a logical answer can seem insensitive because people who have been deeply impacted by some oppression, injustice, or evil personally that they've experienced are not really at a place where they want to hear a logical answer, and I get that. And I don't want to appear insensitive and just kind of come out with some kind of a trite logical answer. But on the other hand, I don't want the question to go unaddressed either. So I, I submit to you a logical explanation to that question. Can God even exist in the midst of an evil world? And, and I draw this in large part from a great apologist of our modern times, Ravi Zacharias. And I would encourage any of you can get a hold of Anything that Ravi Zacharias has written, it will help you immensely to sort out some things. I mean, I, you know, he's a brilliant uh, apologist and theologian. And in fact, if you want help on a personal level with some of this uh, at a deeper level, um, you can, I encourage you to get one of his books that he wrote entitled, Why Suffering? And then the subtitle is, Finding Meaning and Comfort When Life Doesn't Make Sense. Again, the author is Ravi Zacharias, and the title is, Why Suffering? finding meaning and comfort when life doesn't make sense. And so this is one of the logical arguments that he makes in the book about how it is true that God exists even though there's evil in the world. And so the reasoning goes like this. If evil exists, and I think we all will admit and acknowledge that evil exists in our world, if evil exists, then one must assume that good exists in order to know the difference. And if good exists, then one must assume that a moral law exists by which one can differentiate between good and evil. And if a moral law exists, then one must recognize that there has to be a supreme moral law giver to the moral law, and thus that leads one to the existence of God. You see, where there is no moral law giver, then there can be no moral law. If there is no moral law, then there can be no definition of good. If there's no definition of good, then there can be no evil. But all of us know that there's evil. So the logic of the argument is that God exists, but God exists apart from all the evil in the world. And therefore, God has to remain in the paradigm of the, of the conversation. Otherwise, the question itself has no value. Now, questioning the existence of God was not Solomon's issue. He did not question whether God exists because there are many times that he makes reference to God throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon's issue was not 
that he questioned the existence of God. Solomon's issue was something that others might wrestle with, and that is the goodness of God. He questioned the goodness of God, not the existence of God. And if injustice and evil and wickedness in the world don't cause you to question the existence of God, it may cause you to question the goodness of God. This was Solomon's challenge. Uh, and, and the question that goes with this is, why would a good God tolerate such injustice and evil in our world? How can a good God stand idly by while so many people are so horribly impacted by the evil in our world? Now, these are hard questions. And these are real questions offered by real people who experience real pain and real confusion in our world as a result of all the oppression, injustice, and evil around us. And some of you here today are asking similar questions. And if not you, your friends. And, and I pray and trust that at some point, if not in the course of this Bible study, that afterwards, at some point, God's going to bear witness to your heart about his existence and about his goodness. And so let me frame the conversation this way. And in order to do it justice, I have to go all the way back to the beginning to where stories start. And that is to the book of beginnings, and that's the book of Genesis. Now, you don't need to turn there. I'm just going to summarize some events from Genesis so we can get a better understanding about evil and injustice and oppression in the world and the fact still that God exists and that God is good. So in the book of Genesis, here's what we learn. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Six days of creation. After each day of creation, God looked at what he created and said, it is good. After the sixth day, when God created mankind, he said, it is very good. It is very good. At some undisclosed time prior to the creation of the universe, God created angelic beings. Because Job 38 verse 7 tells us that the angels were present rejoicing and singing praises at the time that the universe was created. So at some point in time, angels were created prior to the universe, the heavens and the earth. They're there giving praise to God for creation. Among the angelic beings that God creates was one guardian cherub. Ezekiel 28 describes this angelic being as supremely beautiful, and ranking among the highest of the angelic order. His name was Lucifer or Satan. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28 that when God created him, he was the, Satan's being, Lucifer's actual being, was inlaid with precious gems and stones and framed with gold. I mean, it, he must have been an incredibly beautiful angel to behold. But Ezekiel 28 also tells us that on account of his beauty, pride filled his heart. And that he not only wanted to be like God, the Bible says he wanted to be God. And so he rebelled against God. And he led an undisclosed number of angels with him in this coup. But Revelation chapter 12 tells us that Satan and his angels were not powerful enough and thus, God expelled them from heaven and kicked them out of heaven and hurled them to the earth. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, because Jesus is God and has coexisted, being co-eternal with God, Jesus even said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus saw when Satan was expelled from heaven to earth along with his other angels that had been a part of this rebellion who are now today otherwise known as demons. When Satan first appears in the Bible on earth, it's in the Garden of Eden, in the Genesis account. Garden of Eden was paradise on earth. It was perfect. And in the Garden of Eden, God had placed Adam and then immediately thereafter Eve. And the first man and first woman had it great. But unfortunately, Satan targeted them as the crown jewel of God's creation. Satan, in his hostility towards God and his rebellion towards God, targeted Adam and Eve and persuaded them and convinced them that God was not good and that God was actually holding back on them. And that if they were to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes would be open, they would be wise like God. 
It was the one thing, the one and only thing that God had instructed Adam and Eve. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Literally, the dying process will begin. The reason why God gave them that option was so that their relationship with God would be based on love, not on law. You see, if God had not put the option of choice in the equation, then mankind would have been relegated to a relationship with God because he was forced to. He's like a robot. This is what I have to do. This is how I'm programmed. But God said, there's going to be one tree in the garden amongst all these other wonderful trees. This one tree, don't eat of it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that they could choose life, choose God. But Satan persuaded them, don't believe God. Did God really say? And they ate of that tree. And when they did, they joined Satan in his rebellion against God. Sin filled their hearts, sin filled the human race, and the human race became corrupt. Shortly thereafter, immediately thereafter, you see all the imaginable and unimaginable sins and wickedness and evil manifest in the human race. You just see, you see the first murder before you get barely out of the first couple of chapters where Cain kills his brother Abel. And on and on you go. You see all the injustice and evil and wickedness. You see murder, you see betrayal, you see adultery, you see slavery, you see all kinds of hatred. You see everything against man, against man, man against God. It's just a, a horrific scene. And, and thus the world became corrupt. Humanity was spoiled. Listen, if, if you want to get mad at somebody for the way the world is so wicked and evil and oppressive and unjust, don't get mad at God. Listen, get mad at Satan or get mad at the fallen human race, but don't, don't raise a fist in anger to God. The reason why we see all that we see around this world is because there was an instigator behind it, and his name was Satan. And he persuaded mankind to rebel against God. And ever since then, humanity in its fallen state now manifests all this wickedness and evil in our world. And Satan is still alive and well in his influence. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's what the Bible teaches. Satan is still at work, influencing in a major way the world's ideals and ideas and opinions and values and thoughts and actions. He influences philosophies and education. He influences and he's the reason behind false religions that have been spawned as a result of his lies and his deception. This is all Satan's playground and he's having a heyday with humanity. The Bible calls him the ruler of the kingdom of the air in Ephesians 2.2. The Bible says that he's the one who leads the whole world astray in Revelation 12.9. And Jesus said of him that he's the prince of this world in John 12.31. So Solomon sees this. He sees all the injustice, the evil, the wickedness in the world. Whether or not he understands the dynamics of Satan behind it is unknown to us, but he sees the result for sure. He sees all of this, and it weighs him down. And he's depressed about life, and he, and he questions the meaning of life, and he questions God in the midst of all this oppression and evil and injustice. And so here in verse 1, look again at the text. So what happens is here that he says in verse 1, I saw the tears of the oppressed. I saw the tears. He, he saw hurting people. He saw people who were in pain and distress from the evil in the world, crying and weeping. F.B. Meyer one said, quote, through all the centuries, tears have flowed enough to float a navy. And it's true. I mean, if you could bottle up all the tears that humanity has shed in the course of the past several millennia just in dealing with oppression and evil and injustice in the world, I mean, there's a lot of tears that have been shed. And Solomon says, I see all this. It troubles me. He also notes in the rest of verse 1, and I saw the power was on the side of the oppressors. He says, it grieved me how much bad people were able to get away with bad things. And then he says in verse 2, he says, and I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who were still alive. In other words, he says, you know, the dead are better off than the living because at least the dead now are gone and they don't have to experience this misery on earth. But then he takes it a step further. And in verse 3, he says, but... 
better than both, better than living and the dead, is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. In other words, Solomon says that the one who has an advantage over the living and the dead is a person who has not yet been born because they haven't experienced any of it. Now look, I think all of us would agree. Yeah, I, I hear you, Solomon. I wish we could all be spared from having to see and experience and be a part of the evil and injustice and oppression in our world. I wish paradise had never been lost. I look at my grandkids now and, and I think to myself, what will they be exposed to in the course of their life that try as best as they might, their parents or their grandparents can't protect their innocence from? Because look at how the world has changed in the last 50 years, in the last 15 years. And I think to myself, what will the next generation be exposed to in 15 years from now, in 50 years from now? I shudder to think. Because some of the things that we're experiencing now wasn't even on the radar to our parents' generation. So what does that mean for the next generation and the generation after them? Yes, the world is evil. Yes, the world is wicked. Yes, the world is full of oppression. But Solomon's problem in the midst of that was, once again, he lost sight of God. He looked at all this horizontal mess and he says, this is troubling to me. I, I don't even know about God. And I don't even, I don't even, I'm, I'm questioning all that. And I'm questioning the meaning and purpose of life. And how do we know that he lost, God, lost sight of God in the, in the equation? Because, again, he says twice in verse 1 as it relates to the oppressed, twice in verse 1, and they have no comforter. And they have no comforter. Yes, they do, Solomon. Yes, they do. The Lord is our comforter. But you have forgotten him because you have forsaken him. And you don't even remember the words of your father, Solomon. Because David got it. And David understood. That's why David would write in Psalm 86, verses 7 and 17. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, Lord, for you will answer me. For you, O Lord, have helped me. And you, O Lord, have comforted me. Even Solomon's dad understood this. But Solomon lost sight of the God of his fathers. And therefore, as he looked at all the stuff on the landscape of humanity, he became depressed about it. And he forgot, okay, in the midst of all this, that's right, that's right. Even my father said that God is our comforter and God is our ever-present help in time of need. And God is the one who will never forsake me. And God is the one who will never abandon me. And God is the one who loves me in the midst of all this chaos and wickedness. He lost sight of it. And he lost sight of this other question. And who will judge? all the injustice and oppression and wickedness in the world. God will. God will. Jude, verses 14 and 15 says, See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts that they have done. So, if I could just summarize this in a few bullet points, here's what it would be. First, evil does exist, but it exists apart from God. God is not the author of it, Satan is. It is Satan's influence, his wickedness that has instigated and been behind what we see as a part of the fallen race now of humanity. Evil does exist, but apart from God. The perfect world God intended for us was spoiled a long time ago when Satan rebelled and mankind sinned against God. And as a result, every form of evil and injustice now affects all of us to some degree. To some degree, but God put in motion a plan to save us from our sins, to comfort us in our sorrows, and to rescue us from this wicked world through Jesus. Through Jesus. And he will judge the world with justice and punish every evil act. Now, some of you might say in response to this, well, okay, great. What is his delay? I mean, if God exists and God is good, then what is he waiting for? Maybe you. Maybe he's waiting for you. God doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. He's still waiting for people to get saved. He's still waiting for people to get saved. 
You see, for those of you who know Jesus, you could be anxious for God to settle this mess. But I still have friends and loved ones who don't know Jesus. And in that regard, his delay is his mercy. See, let's say you got saved in the last year and you came to faith in Christ. What if Jesus had come two years ago? You wouldn't be as happy for his quick return. Who he is waiting for and how long he will wait is his prerogative. But I know that in his delay, it is mercy for as many people to get saved. Yeah, but Pastor G, doesn't that mean, though, that with every generation that he waits, there's a greater number of people who will not respond to his love and they will be condemned. So what's the deal there? I know. But who he's waiting for and how long he waits is his prerogative. His delay is his mercy for as many people to get saved. And all I know is this. It's what John the Baptist said in Luke chapter 3. He was quoting from the prophet Isaiah. In Luke 3, 5 and 6, he said, Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. In other words, he says, all that seems out of order and all that seems out of balance and all that seems crooked in this world will be leveled and will be made straight. Every injustice will be judged. Every oppression will be lifted. And every evil will be punished. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So don't turn from God, please. Turn toward God and find his grace and his comfort and his hope in a wicked world. God will take care of this wicked world. And in the meantime, he will help us to persevere and he will comfort us along the way. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, this is, this is troubling to us when we think about the many people in our world, some maybe who are listening to this Bible study. And they have questioned your existence or your goodness. And we, we get it, Lord. We're, we're not detached. We recognize that because of the evil and wickedness that people can experience and the oppression that people have experienced, it can be hard. It can be painful. It can be brutal. We pray for your comfort on all those who have been oppressed. We thank you for the hope of heaven. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. We thank you that you comfort us in our sorrows. And you offer us the hope and the promise of heaven when we die. Lord, are you waiting for someone here even in this Bible study? Are you waiting for someone who will turn their lives to you and surrender to your Lordship? I pray, Lord, that if so, they would respond to you today. They wouldn't wait another minute. They wouldn't wait another day to get right with you. We don't profess to have all the answers, Lord, but we know that you do. And so we trust you. We rely on you. We lean on you and not our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you and we trust you to direct our paths. And for those who don't know you today, Lord, I pray right now they'd open their heart to Jesus. And I'm going to pause in my prayer with your head still bowed, and I'm just going to give you the invitation to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God's going to sort all this wicked world out. But right now, at this moment, it's about you and him alone. And if you don't know the Lord, if you're not right with him, I invite you to accept him into your heart today and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. You can do it by praying a simple prayer. I'll lead you in this prayer. And if you want to pray this with me, you just pray it silently where you're seated. You can just repeat it after me. You can just say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you came into this world to save sinners like me. I'm going to trust you to sort out all the wickedness in the world. But right now, it's just about you and me. That my sins will be forgiven that you'd comfort me in my sorrows and that you'd take me home on that great day whenever you return again or whenever I die, whichever happens first, that I go to be with you forever. So I surrender my life to you right now. I confess Jesus is Lord 
with my mouth. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be saved. I surrender to you, Lord. Come into my life, take over. Be my Savior, my Lord. And together, Father, all of us just look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord, to persevere in the midst of a sin-filled world. We thank you that you loved us so much you entered into this chaos to rescue us and redeem us, to save us. And we hold on to that hope, Lord. And it's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray these things. And everybody said, amen.